decided on doing some scientific research. Whenever I went to see him and asked for what's the man, how should I proceed? Which direction should I go? He always said, man, I really do not know. If I knew the answer, if I knew how to do it, I would have done it a long time ago. And I was shocked at that time. In the university, a professor know most of the things. They will be honestly telling me something they do not know. In high school, teachers always know everything. <laughs> in graduate school, then you will meet a very famous professor. He said, I don't know anything. And the subject will be doing research. So professor Mann always asked me, what's new when he came to the laboratory? So I have to tell him what I found in the lab. And the next question is, what are you going to do next? And that's only two questions he asked me throughout my PhD career. What's new? What are you going to do next? <laughs> and then two and a half years later, he told me, you've done enough. You can invite your PhD thesis and finish your PhD work. So I protested, protested very strongly. I said, Professor Man, my parents gave me an airline ticket. They part for their saving to come to the United States. I walked with you. You always ask me, what's new? What are you going to do next? You never taught me anything. And now you want me to get a PhD and take me out. So I thought it's the first time he was smiling and he said, you ain't, you really learn a lot. You are really a good scientist. Later on, I understood that for scientific, for being a scientist, you really need to be independent, try to find solutions and know where to go. So now, in Taiwan, I always ask students, what's new? <laughs> <laughs> what are we going to do next? And when students ask me a question, I said, I don't really know. <laughs> if I knew, I would have done it. And this thing is a dilemma. So, I don't want to tell you that they, in the university, when you are all learning, it's going to be useless. In the university, when you have school, you learn a lot of things. In the process of learning, you learn the method or technique of learning new things. And that will become very important. If you don't learn to learn new things yourself, then all the knowledge accumulated might not be that useful. So I also, against school, tried to walk you so far and took so much time away from you, and you don't have time to learn, to learn new things, to be your own master. So I think I have gone too far field. But as I mentioned, we are in the crossroad. We will wake up in the first century, in the turning point. If we do not wake up, then thousand years from now, people will write the history. They said, what a stupid bunch of our ancestors living in the 21st century. <laughs> we in our ecosystem and made it miserable. Well, I think it's uh, the final slide shows. Thank you very much for Scott. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much.
research. And hopefully, then the, the, the technology level can be shared uh, more, more than the, the present time. But unfortunately, it takes every party to do the same. And I'm afraid there will be some people who will never be willing to share. And uh, I think we, we can all guess uh, where these people are. They are all over the place. So uh, increasing public support for research, uh, basic research and technology development is it's good. But uh, what do you foresee the mechanism to talk the other people, more greedy people, into sharing your, your ideas? Do you think there's any chance? If the scientific research is with the motivation of making profit, especially those research in pharmaceutical companies, then it certainly would be almost impossible to ask them to share the knowledge. On the other hand, if public domain were to support the scientific research more and more, then international collaboration will make it easier. So let me make one example. We all worry about avian flu. It's not a question of whether it will come or not. It's when will it come. In 1918 and 1919, Spanish flu took 50 million lives from the Earth. The problem is more than the entire population, about the entire population of China, 50 million. Avian flu when you start to communicate, helping to the human being and communicate among the human being, that will cause serious problems. But if you look at the vaccine industry or pharmaceutical industry making vaccine, it's very inadequate. With six billion people on Earth, for the United States through vaccine generation, the infection is only 200 million. It's not enough. During the SARS period last year, I tried to convince pharmaceutical company to invest more money in the SARS research. They are not interested. SARS might be gone this year, for example, no, it's not here, it disappeared. So in developing vaccine, you don't know whether flu is coming next year or the year after, and what will occur next. So private sector are not interested. But for people in Asia, avian flu might be very important. So we have been able to persuade our government and say, for $200 million to set up the facilities of producing vaccine. At the same time, we will be doing vaccine research. So, if the research and manufacturing were to collaborate among Asian countries, then we will be able to solve the even rural problem ourselves. So I, I do believe that the intervening intervention of public domain will become important. So even through even through vaccine, I think we are committed. And hopefully, I think APEC, US, and Singapore is also setting up a research center. My own university is excellent in medical research. I'm sure we join forces together in the Asian country, we can do well. And that will be the first move, the direction of the book. That's a good start. In fact, we, we are already setting up a, uh, a monitoring center for emerging diseases as well as a national institute for vaccine development here in Thailand. And, uh, uh, as well as a Thailand Center of Excellence for Life Science, which will eventually promote uh, setting up an improvement of manufacturing 
services in their life cycle. And we probably can talk more about this and welcome your, your advice, your suggestion to, and perhaps even collaboration between us. Thank you very much. Thank you.
behind. If you want to deal with large number of uh, large quantity of information, like in bioinformatics, you probably will have to know more about the computer or manipulation of large number of data. Okay. Even chemistry department might not teach it. So you really have to move. You should not give up the fundamentals. the background closer, closer to your mouth. Got together 
and discussing how can we help the communities. Africa, the problem Africa is facing was raised. Scientists have been talking about capacity building in Africa for many, many, many years. They didn't think that make drastic change. So I suggested maybe we should have an African Olympia. Some of the leading countries like the United States, or European Union, or Japan, form a group of academies, maybe 10 academies join each group and try to compete, see which group can help Africa better in five years later. See the result. Who can help Africa better? In order to do that, you really have to go into Africa to understand all the problems. So I would like to change the competition into collaboration and compete as a group. The purpose is to see who can help other people better. Actually, in scientific research, we always say that the science will bring benefit to mankind. So we are still competing. But at the present time, need a better collaboration and better sharing of the fruit of the science. I, I don't know whether I answer your question or not. I want to think you have mentioned uh, Madam Mary Curie. Uh, she didn't uh, apply for patents for her discovery. So I like very much to hear your comment on that. Well, that was a long time ago. At the time, when she didn't patent her discoveries, then people can use it all everywhere and apply what they discovered, like radium, how to isolate radium, polonium and used for the medical purposes. But the world has changed now. If you discover something and say knowledge belongs to mankind, if you don't patent, then what will happen? Somebody else will patent it and say when you use it, they give me the patent fee. And that's the dilemma we are facing. Long time ago, I was at Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory, the University of California. When they discuss something about isotope separation, they always said I should patent. I said no. I want to learn from Madame Curie. I do not want to patent. Then the patent officer from Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory came to my office and said, "You're wrong. In the modern society, if you want your knowledge to become available to everybody, then you should patent." the knowledge and they transfer to the government. So I didn't know whether this is really the right thing to do or not. So I did apply for the patent. But the officer, they helped me and I transferred the patent to the Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory. United States government gave me one dollar the time. My students, so they did die, you see, they make a little scalp it and put my picture to replace the picture in one dollar bill and said Professor Lee violated his principle he made one dollar. So my student uh, certainly for the way of my mission. So this is really uh, uh, become a very complicated issue. But it's interesting. About six years ago when I went to DuPont, DuPont Company, I gave a speech in the University of Pennsylvania, I went to DuPont Company and went to their pigment uh, research center. They are making automobile paint. They use very expensive pigment. It goes through discharge in the case waste and the pigment become very expensive. They told me, Professor Lee, it's a proprietary information. You should not tell others why we are doing this. I said, I know you are making money, but do you know what's happening in the discharge chamber? 
He said, no, you do not know. So I said, well, if I'm right, I do believe that the, the reason of this child is you're producing oxygen atoms in single D state, metastable state. That way you insert in the C-H bomb, bomb a C-O-H, so it's very dispersive, dissolving water. So I said, if I'm right, you are very stupid that you spend so much money setting up the CDT, put the pigment in powder, in the case space, and go through this time. I said, if I were you, I'll bring in ozone, make it lag at 250 nanometer. When you switch the ozone, produce 90% of oxygen atom in single D. That will make the pigment powder very uh, dispersive. He didn't know what I was talking was saying, but I said, if you don't believe me, you can ask a scientist in the University of Pennsylvania and why don't you try it. Three years later, one of the professors came and said, man, you are absolutely right. You can change all the plan according to what you suggested. Awesome process now. I didn't get a penny. You didn't get a penny. So that professor said, when you should ask money from the Yukon company, they make a millions and millions of dollars. But as a scientist, I still believe that the knowledge belongs to mankind. But this time, my knowledge belongs to Yukon. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's a big dilemma. But not because of that, I will inhibit my free discussion of science. If I go to another company, people ask me some questions, Certainly, we still discuss freely. We don't say that, hmm, I think about this and go home in the right pattern and then come and tell me what's going on. I will do that. But as a president of the academy, all the people doing research, I have to make sure that our pattern of this, our pattern of the discovery before somebody else happens for their own use. That's a very complicated issue. <laughs> we have to solve. Yeah, uh, Professor Lee, but it, the, the underlying theme of the whole patent system, intellectual property rights, is to stimulate research and development. Right. Right. So with, with your view against patenting uh, and, and, and making money, would that reduce research activity? Activity with, with, without patent law, companies will not pour money into research and development. And, and, and I think that, that's not what we want. Well, people will spend money to do research in the area they are sure they likely to make money. And so there are dilemmas. But if you look at the major scientific discovery, nothing was planned. If you look at the now we are uh, depending so much on the computers, information sciences, the way the transistor was discovered. In the paper, they said, this is very interesting, but might not be useful. But knowing that they, it's really transformed the human society. If somebody working on vacuum tube, try to improve the vacuum tube, you will not discover transistor. So in a sense, scientific research by itself has to vary. So public sector should support scientific discoveries. But some group of people will have to work hard to make good use of all those scientific norms. As you know, because of the long cultural heritage of China, if you do something useful, you will be these scars. And so in, in my institute, sometimes somebody has done something very useful. You say, no, 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 this is not very useful. This is really theoretical interest. And it's quite strange how to inherit it. I believe that the scholars is high above to do something useless. So scientific research by itself has to be supported very strongly. And then the transmission, transformation of knowledge should be done in a more older fashion, not just for profit making purposes. As you mentioned that when
when you were a PhD student at the University of California at Berkeley, you were asked by your supervisor what you want to do next. I would like to know how did you uh, choose your topic for your scientific research? Well, topic was given by my research advisor for mutual agreement. As a student, I'm this month, when he started, he didn't help. Famous professor knew what's known, what is not known. So when he said, if I know, I would have done it. He was very honest. Most of the excellent scientists know the boundary of knowledge. So he knew what is not known is worth doing. So he gave me the subject and you, you want to find out, give me an addition process. But he didn't know the answer, how to do it. And sometimes his suggestion based on what people have done before, that's really totally useless. So when you design something, try to do some experiment, you really have to think very hard. Is that a good way of doing it? And if it fails, then you have to find out why it's not working. What would be the modification needed to make things go? And those are very complicated process. And if you do it pretty soon, professor ask you, how did you find out? Then you have to tell teach your, your professors because I read a paper about child resonance charge exchange and that's an interesting phenomenon. I thought it might be useful in my research. And you have to keep on telling the professor, even nod your head and say, mm, that's a good idea. So Every night you have to think very hard. So that's a challenge. It's a challenge. But I also I've also seen many famous professors use students as their pair of hands. So professor know what you should do next week and tell you if you finish it, a week later you should do this. And then a month later you should accomplish this. Well, the professor knows how to do it and want you to do it. I don't think it's very fair. Sometimes it's just accumulating the data and use it as a, as a pair of hands. But I also do not say that if you should walk with somebody and always say, I don't know anything. <laughs> <laughs> because he, he might be a great scientist, but at the same time, you know, say, I do not know anything. Maybe he was too lazy to learn something. Yeah, that's good. So, and thank you very much for very valuable the questions and answers. If there is no more questions, I'd like to uh, invite Professor Murray to give a conclusion. Yeah, I'd be great. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Lee. I think during this past uh, Two hours, uh, we have really done a lot. At least I have many uh, take home comments and take home things that need to be done. Uh, the first thing, perhaps, is to, to talk with the, the chairman of the chemistry department, make sure that his uh, revised uh, BSc curriculum will have a lot of physics and computer science as well as biology in it. The same thing goes through for the head of the biology department to make sure that the curriculum also has chemistry and physics in it as well. So aside from that, I think we agree that, that we have done a lot uh, through this uh, very uh, vast and, and indeed valuable experiences. Uh, not only his view on peace, on science and in technology, but also many uh, many matters along the, 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 the line of, of development of science. I think he have candidly uh, given us his, his ideas and his thought, uh, the views of how students should perform or how professors should treat their students. I think it's very valuable. Uh, I
which uh, that we have staffs like Professor Lee, who could talk to prime ministers and prime ministers listen. I wish I have staffs like Professor Lee, who talked to 700 high school students like he did yesterday. Actually, he met Prime Minister Hatsin this morning, coming out from the elevator, and then Primary, uh, Prime Minister Hatsin uh, greeted him. Maybe he went to high school yesterday. And someone who gave a, a very insight lecture into uh, science like he did this afternoon. Uh, with that, I think he perhaps uh, would be kind enough to come back here again often and sometimes stay long. <laughs> and uh, you have our uh, open invitation. When would you like to come to Faculty of Science? Just, just let us know. Uh, tell us when you come. Tell us how long you would like to be. If, if it's as much longer as you, as, as you wish, and, and we wish it could be as long as, as possible. So uh, please let us know. I do want to say one thing. Before I came here, I met uh, your Prime Minister Taksin. He was surprised that I'm here. And he was very happy to see me. And he did say that he don't invite me to come back anytime. So I will come back the next time. The prime purpose will be try to persuade Prime Minister Taksin science and education are the most important thing for the development of health, social scientific research. I will make a trip to do that. With that, uh, thank you very much and we look forward to the next lecture in a couple more months. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we will open the next room for the interview of the press. Um, it will be time. Professor Ray will kindly help us with the uh, translation. So uh, I would like to invite the press and some of the audience who are interested to, to join us. But uh, for all of the other audience, we would like to invite you to have a coffee and tea, which is available just outside this room. Thank you very much for coming to join us.